In this series on Do It, we're going to show you how we were able to CNC mill one of these and how I 3D printed this. So you may have noticed that in any of our shots in front of my kegerator, it sits in front of an uncovered electrical outlet. It's a little unsightly. Probably should have done something about it a long time ago. But instead of going out and buying a cover for it, we thought let's recreate one and compare the differences between CNC milling it out of wood and 3D printing it. This video is in connection with several others in this series and they make sense when they're viewed together but you don't really have to watch them in any particular order. At the end you'll see links to each one of them as well as in the description below. In this segment you can follow along as I recreate a 3D model of an electrical outlet cover in Google SketchUp. So here's an example as to why a lot of people don't appreciate using uh, SketchUp for creating things for 3D printing or other CNC applications. Watch when I create this circle. You can tell that it's not a, a perfect arc. It's actually a series of segments and I can tell you exactly how many. 24 segments make up this circle's circumference. And you can see SketchUp even treats them like line segments. Each one is an endpoint and has a midpoint and another endpoint. It's accurate, uh, but it has its limitations. There are little tricks around this to try and, and up the, the resolution of, of arcs and circles, and that is simply to just change the number of segments in that circle. So if I just boost this puppy up to like uh, 80, let's see if it lets me. Boom, there we go. And so now it almost, again, it appears like it's a perfect circle, when, but however, it is, it's not. If you zoom in far enough or if you use the pencil tool, you can see there's the midpoint and there's the endpoint. So keep that in mind if you're ever going to use SketchUp. I still love using it because it's, it's just so dang easy to learn. It doesn't take a whole lot of uh, computer power and it does the job for simple applications. So I had fun modeling this. Um, and in fact, we are looking at it upside down for, from the orientation of this actual model. I started on the underside like this. And what we're going to be doing today is replicating this model. I went ahead and added some dimensions that we're going to use for reference. We're going to bring in the axes. So let's go ahead and begin. And uh, naturally, I started with the overall rectangle that we're dealing with. And uh, since I was using my digital calipers, everything's to the uh, uh, thousandth of an inch. Three by 4.7. And I'm going to center it to our origin using my guides here. All right, so far so good. Uh, and then I believe I just extruded the full height, which it shows here is 0.185 inches. There we go. Next, and it looks like I'm missing a dimension here. How much did I offset that rectangle? Looks like an eighth of an inch, 125,000. Offset, 0.125. I believe I, I recessed this about just half of the, uh, of the full thickness. And so what we can do here is grab our extrusion tool and then snap to the midpoint. All right, so far so good. Uh, let's bring a couple guides back to get the center. Even though we have the origin, uh, it's buried. So uh, we'll go ahead and get a couple guides to, here we go, snap to the midpoint there. So this center part doesn't, um, it might seem a little obscure or um, irregular, but it's actually pretty simple as long as you know where to, um, uh, where to make your changes. So it uh, looks like it's centered vertically and I made it, let's delete these guides, a quarter of an inch wide and um, the fully raised part here in the center is also just to keep it square, a quarter of an inch uh, and that's where our center or screw hole is going to go. Let's just start by Oh, 
bringing it out sent from the center an eighth of an inch eighth of an inch and from the side here 0.125 and that's probably what I did triple click right click make it a group and we'll unify everything at the end so rectangle tool he got push pulled up to complete the full thickness of the cover and from here once again we're going to use our guides so from the center out one eighth of an inch out one eighth of an inch and let's just use the line tool here to divide this face and so now you can see we've created three separate faces on the top let's delete my guides right here you can use the move tool to just bring everything right down like that over over this line make sure you're locked on the blue axis and bring it down to that face there we are so far so good so next we've got to worry about the geometry that's going to make the two outlet holes and the screw hole oh but before we do that let's triple click and you know what we can do there's there's multiple ways you could do this um, the easiest is if you've got Pro, Google SketchUp Pro, these Boolean operations, the solid tools, I believe the toolbar is called, use your outer shell and select one solid, two solids, and it creates them as you now one solid group. Next, the circle. Looks like we're dealing with a diameter I put about 0.135. Another annoying feature about SketchUp is when you create arcs or circles, it only asks for a radius. I am not aware of how to input the diameter value of an arc or circle I'm wanting to create. See it down here, it's asking for radius. So the way I go around that is I bring up my calculator, and I believe we were dealing with 0.135 divided by 2. 0.0675. And again, we're dealing with SketchUp, so you've got only 24 segments in the circle. If that resolution bothers you, then you can certainly try and up it. However, it's at this small of a scale, 24 segments is probably just fine. And you know what else I forgot to do? This needs to be within the group we created, so I'm going to cut that, go inside it. So I've double-clicked into the group, edit, paste in place, and we should be able to push-pull down all the way to that face and create our hole and there we are so now it's time for the two outlet holes and what i think we're going to do is model them out in space copy one so that it's spaced exactly as it should be from the first and then i think using references we're going to move them directly to this face and extrude them through and make the holes so let's see what we got here 0.75 that's three quarters of an inch on this straight part and about an inch and an eighth, 1.125 height-wise. So if we start with the smaller one, so this, this is in, if we start with just the inner box, which is three quarters by one and an eighth, and then we can model outward uh, and create some even arcs. By the way, there's probably a million ways to do this. I am probably doing it the most difficult way. So again, if you... Uh, are skilled in this kind of thing and want to drop me a line let me know how i can improve to make sure that these are centered let's just work outward from the center 1.37 divided by 2 is 0.685 and from here it's just a matter of making some two-point arcs start finish center so let's up the resolution so like I said before you can see those segments let's go 36 there we go two point arc start finish center 36 use our eraser tool get rid of that edge and that edge and we've got an uninterrupted shape it says here it's 0.415 inches apart let's make that happen Selecting this guy by double clicking gets the face and all surrounding edges. Use the move tool. I want to use the bottom edge and hit control to toggle copying. That way, when I lock to the green, so notice I'm moving all around this face here. If I hit the left arrow key, I'm locked on the green axis. 
and I go right to that line. There's our two guys. Half of 0.415 is what we need to find the center, 0.2075. And that's the center point we're going to use to reference when we moved, move both of these holes onto this face. So let's create a finishing reference, and I'm going to start with a line that's a part of this face, so I know it's at the right height. I'm going to lock it to the green axis and find the midpoint of that center part. Same concept here, that dot represents midpoint. Double click, hold shift, double click, use your move tool, and when I move them, I hover over that intersection, and I'm going to find the intersection of guides that we just created. They're not part of the, uh, the group, however, so once again, I'm going to have to select them, cut from their location, double click into the group, paste in place, and there we go. Yes. So with what we've got finished so far, you could stop right here and 3D print this or make this uh, however you wanted to and with the dimensions that you've got and it would be just fine. But um, I wanted to go a step further and let's make that countersink. So if we look at it from the underside here, countersink for the head of the screw. Uh, the chamfered edge, and some customization. So let's start with that countersink. It can get kind of tricky creating a feature like this. There's a couple ways to go about it. So if you recall earlier when we were saying, hey, maybe you could up the resolution of this circle by adding segments to it. If you remember, I chose not to, and I, I forgot there was a, a reason for that, not just because I thought at this scale, 24 segments is enough. But when you change the number of segments, you need to keep track of exactly how many segments you put in each arc or circle if you want it to be compatible with uh, future changes in scaling or, or moving. And, uh, and you'll see what I mean right now. So let's take a look at the dimensions. And the outer diameter is 0.27. If I made a circle there, and of course now we've got to find the radius of 0.27 divided by 2 is 0.135. And, oh now here's a fun thing also. So our origin is our exact uh, center point on this face. And you can see how the, or, the um, axes lay flat on this face. The circle wants to jump around all kinds of ways of orientation. So if I went to click to make a circle here, it's not exactly on the plane I want it to be. So here's a little sketch, uh, trick within SketchUp. Hover over uh, a face that orients a circle or whatever geometry you want uh, in that orientation. And if you hold Shift, it will maintain that orientation no matter where you choose to, be, to start it. So in my case, I want it at the origin. Click to start it, and when I let go, it's on that face. And... Notice it's on the outside of the group, so I'll have to double click, cut, enter that group, paste in place. There we go. So you see we've divided the face uh, into this donut here. If the number of segments of concentric circles match, they are fairly compatible. So if I went to recess this to the depth of the countersink that we want, I would use the move tool. It's selected. I'm going to hit my up arrow key on the keyboard to lock to the z-axis. And you can see how we get that nice, smooth, featured countersink. If, let's say, I decide, oh, I want the resolution of this circle, the amount of segments, to be significantly higher. So let's double it to 48. Now, it will not create the faces the way it should, and they won't interact properly. Look at that weirdness. Yeah, I don't know. It's doing something but it's definitely not what we want. So I'm going to undo, and let's lower this to the depth that uh, I specified, and I believe it was 0.062, enter, and hopefully when all said and done, if I click on this, we still have a solid group, which is important sometimes when, you're, uh, when you know you're going to output this to 
uh, for 3D printing, it, it really helps avoid some problems uh, down the road in terms of interpreting between the model um, and whatever your printing software is. Now for the chamfer, so what helps sometimes is to take this into wire, or not necessarily wireframe, but this x-ray, so that way all the faces are still visible. And let's just kind of eyeball a, so let's see, I don't think I want to go to the midpoint. That's kind of deep. So we'll go hover just above it. Looks pretty good. Now we're going to use the, oh, I forgot. Got to be inside the group. Cut, edit, paste in place. And there we are. We should have divided the faces like that. And we're going to use the follow me tool. If you select the path you want it to go first, it's a lot easier. So we'll select its path, follow me tool and click on the face. Ta-da! Lastly, let's give it some flair. You could add anything you want to it, but I'm gonna show you how I did the do it. 3D text. I used Rockwell Extra Bold. The height is, and I probably scaled it, but let's just leave it where it is, and it looks like it's extruded a 16th of an inch, 0 0.0625 on this face, and I, it looks like I definitely scaled it. So in this case, if I wanted to remember to make the IT the exact same size. I will remember that I brought it down. If you look to the lower right hand of the screen where it says scale, 0.8. That way when I create the IT, I know exactly how much to scale it. Otherwise, I need to go in and specify a more exact height than 7 eighths of an inch. And as long as this is in contact with that face, these are solid components. If I use my outer shell, select one solid to the other, and now I've got one solid group, and it's ready to export for 3D printing. To do that, you would just select it, and you can do it in a number of ways. Um, I actually have a plugin I downloaded from the extension warehouse called Export STL, and it allows me to export just the selection. Uh, the new version of SketchUp is actually pretty cool. It has some 3D model exporting options like OBJ, object files, um, and a couple other options that a lot of uh, 3D printing software can converse with. There you go. Thanks for watching this one till the end, guys. And don't miss out on the other videos related to making one of these. We'll see you next time.